thank you so much. I'm, uh, I'm mindful of the fact that I, I, I gave a talk, um, actually about 25 years ago, I was named Assistant Deputy Mayor of Education in Chicago. And my son Malik said, you don't look anything like a Deputy Mayor. And, um, and then he, uh, he reminded me of a year earlier, I'd gotten my doctorate and I came out of the defense since Malik was five years old at the time and he said, did you win? And I said, yes. <laughs> he said, well now you're a doctor but not the kind who can help anybody, right? And I've always tried to <laughs> keep that in mind. So I have a couple of uh, uh, preludes before I really begin. And um, first let me say, um, mic check. Oh man, let me try it again. If you don't know, when I say mic check, you have to say mic check. Mic check. check. This is the, one of the innovations of the Occupy movement. It's called the people's microphone. And when they say mic check, whatever you say, if you, you need to get out more. Have you been to the Occupy, any <laughs> Occupy sites? Um, one of the great things is to stand up at a general assembly. Whatever you say will be repeated. And so I've learned, I've done a bunch of teach-ins at various Occupy sites, and one of the things I've learned is to say, after you say mic check, now let's practice mic check. You look beautiful. You look beautiful. I love you. I love you. See how much better I feel now already. You know, it's like an amazing thing. So whatever you want to hear, you just spit that out and then it comes spitting back at you. Um, two quick things I want to I want to note. One is that I um, I wrote a talk which I'm mostly not going to read, and then I thought of ten other talks I'd like to give, and I'll give you a couple of titles. And this is uh, a hint for what you might. Um, might want to ask me in the question and answer because I would like to have a dialogue. This room isn't perfect for it, but we'll do our best. Uh, so one, one uh, title I have is The School Wars in 10 Words. Um, another title is It Works, The Problem with Progress. Another title is um, Rule Number One, Break the Rules. Um, and then A Bright Idea, A Shorter School Day, and A Three-Day Work Week. So these are some of the things that I'd love to talk about if we have time in the question and answer. The other thing I'd like to do before I really begin is to acknowledge in the first place, as a sign of respect and reverence, the people who preceded us on this coast and in this land, people who lived their complicated and unique lives, fished and hunted, worked, loved, raised up the generations, built their homes, and buried their dead here. Let's also note that we're here by the grace of many, many others, our communities and our families to be sure, our various ancestors, our mentors, blessed good fortune and brute luck, and also the masses of workers who toiled in the mills and mines, those who quarried the stone and made the bricks and gathered the timber, fashioned the steel, built the roads, dug the canals, poured the cement, refined the fuel, harvested the crops, generated the power, wove the fiber, and a lot more, including the people who were at this moment serving us and taking care of cleaning your rooms and so on. So let's welcome, let's welcome all of those people to the Big Ideas Festival as well. Um, and, and let's not forget who we are and where we are as we have this gathering. It's well known that Americans are geographically challenged. We have a difficult time knowing where we are. And most of you know that there was a study done three or four years ago by National Geographic where American kids between the ages of 18 and 25 were given a blank map of the world and that they were to fill in the names of the countries. And 80% couldn't find Iraq, and 80% couldn't find Palestine, Israel, 40% couldn't find Great Britain, and 10% couldn't find the United States. That usually makes us laugh, because we can find the United States, damn it. The others, not so much. Um, uh, especially if I asked you, and we're a gathering of very intelligent, thoughtful, successful people, and if I asked you right now, quick, draw a freehand sketch of Iraq, um, that'd be hard for you, for many of you. Identify the main cities, the bordering countries, it'd be hard for most of us. And, uh, and yet we've been a presence in their lives and not a particularly pleasant presence for 10 years. So I, I, I say that simply to say, let's remember where we're located. Let's remember that 95% of the world's people don't own a commuter and that 70% don't have um, uh, a bank account and that 75% uh, have never used a phone. The reason I mention that is simply to remind us where we're located and who we are. And let's welcome those people to the Big Ideas Fest as well. I say all this now at the start to remind us of what is both obvious and easily forgotten. The unseen, the hidden, the invisible, the indefinite, the unfamiliar, the unknown, and the mysterious, the unheard of and the forgotten are vast, 
While our various maps of the known world, our blueprints and our guides are limited, paltry, and if history can be a guide here, mostly castles in the sky. We are, after all, in spite of the existential feeling of things and in spite of our own natural narcissism, finite beings plunging through an infinite space and gazing uneasily toward the expanding heavens. We're in the middle of things and at the end of nothing. We are, all of us, diving into the wreckage, which is the title of my comments today. We are all of us diving into the wreckage. And as W.H. Auden said, we must love one another or we die. So that is enough of that. What I offer here by way of comments to get us talking um, is an embarrassment in four parts and 25 minutes. Actually, I have 25 minutes and then the pepper spray. There's an app up here, the pepper spray. <laughs> And I have to leave, or you said you might electrify the podium. I know you're going to do one of those things. So an embarrassment in four parts. Part one, and this is possibly the big idea that I wish we would all carry with us at all times. Part one is about democracy. We live in a putative democracy, possibly an aspirational democracy, certainly a flawed democracy, but a democracy nonetheless. And we have to take seriously that location if we're going to make the kinds of changes that would be worthwhile um, in the schools or anywhere else. If you Google Joel Westheimer and read any of his books, they are focused on this question of democracy and education. One of the ways that Joel and I have talked about it over the years is to think about this. Every school system anywhere in history or anywhere in the world um, serves the society that it lives in. If you want to know about a society, you can look into its schools. If you want to know what its schools will be like, you can analyze the society. That's true whether you're talking about apartheid South Africa, or whether you're talking about a communist Romania, or whether you're talking about fascist Italy, uh, or whether you're talking about medieval Saudi Arabia. Schools serve societies. And, and one of the things that we know is that school people in all the countries that I just mentioned have as part of their goal that young people learn the subject matter, show up on time, do their homework, don't get pregnant, don't get drug addicted or drunk, and we have those goals too. Those are good goals. But does that mean that we are exactly the same as the schools in fascist Germany or medieval Saudi Arabia? I hope not, because in every one of those other countries, autocratic, authoritarian, whatever else they teach, they teach the standards of obedience and conformity. Whatever else is taught, literature, you know, um, music, uh, mathematics, um, history, whatever else is taught along with that subject matter comes the primary lessons in obedience and conformity. And we would think that in a democracy there would be something else underlying the project of education. And it's that something else that I want to focus on for just a second. What is that other thing? Because again, you know, um, if you think about the success of a school system like South Africa or a school system like fascist Germany or the Soviet Union, those school systems produced incredible scientists, athletes, artists, successful people. Is that good enough? Is that what we're doing? Is that OK? In our, my opinion, I think in your opinion, it's not OK. So we have to foreground something that we too often assume without articulating, and that is a democracy demands something else. And the something else is based on a very fragile and precious ideal that is an ideal that underlines um, what a democratic society is about. And that ideal is simply stated and very, very difficult to um, execute. The ideal is this, that every human being, no matter who, is of incalculable value. Every human being is of incalculable value, and we are free and equal in rights and responsibilities. We are free. And this is encoded in our Constitution. It's encoded in uh, the UN Declaration of Human Rights. And yet, we have to reread it now and then to remind ourselves that the precious and fragile ideal that every human being is of incalculable value has implications for education. One of the implications is that we assume and we should write this down and etch it into our minds that the fullest development of any individual depends on the full development of all of us. And conversely, the fullest development of all of us depends on the full development of each individual. That is the democratic aspiration put into language for schools. 
That tells us something about our responsibility. What that means from a policy perspective is easy to see. It means that the savage inequalities that characterize the schools that we have are unacceptable. They are unacceptable to have in the Chicago area schools that operate on $30,000 per kid per year. And right down the street, a school that operates on $4,000 per kid per year. That's something that has dropped off the table a public discussion, but it's something we should be outraged about. How can we possibly pretend that we're living in a democracy if that's the, uh, if that's the reality that we see? And that's only the most bold and bald and kind of glaring example. Access to library cards, access to museums, and all the rest of it is, is truncated along lines of class and race and traditional oppressions. This is unacceptable. It's something we should be working against. Not because we can solve it tomorrow or wish away the reality of our whole history. We can't. But we can name it as an aspiration. We can name it as where we need to go. And the interesting thing as well is that the idea of every human being being of incalculable value has implications for curriculum and teaching as well. And as I said, in an autocratic or authoritarian society, underneath everything else are the values of obedience and conformity. In a true, vibrant, authentic, bubbling democracy, underneath everything else we teach, music, math, science, etc., underneath everything are the values of initiative, courage, imagination, entrepreneurship, the ability to think for yourself and have a mind of your own, to sort out judgment from evidence. This is what we teach, if we're true to the democratic aspiration. Now, one other thing I, I mentioned briefly last night, but I want to just expand for a second. What this means to me, in, in, the, in the phrase of John, John Dewey, I believe, said a uh, long, long time ago, that whatever the best parents have for their children in a democracy, that's what we want for all of our children. I think of it a little bit differently. Whatever the most privileged and wisest parents have access to and, and, and aspire to for their children, that is exactly the standard, the bottom line, of, or, or the starting point even, the baseline, of what we want for everyone in the community. You know, so if the President of the United States sent his kids to the University of Chicago Lab School, and when he was moving to Washington, there was great discussion about where would they send the kids, where would they send the kids. There was no doubt in my mind they were going to send the kids to Sidwell Friends, which is where they sent the kids. Arne Duncan spent 12 years at the lab school. My kids went to the lab school. What did they find at the lab school? Tiny classes, and at Sidwell Friends, capped at 15. A curriculum based in part on pursuing your own interests, your own passions. Um, a a, a well-resourced school, a well-resourced classrooms, and teachers who were not only committed and respected, but unionized. So when we were at the lab school, the teachers went on strike. And we supported the strike. Why not? They wanted fewer kids in the classroom. We agree. So it's not like this is the big enemy, the big danger is somehow that teachers might get together and discuss things. You know, that's not, that's not a big danger to me. Um, uh, parentheses. You know, the, the best, good working conditions are good teaching conditions. And good teaching conditions are good learning conditions. That's just true. And I don't care how you cut it. Who do you want at the table thinking about what good working conditions are in your school? I know for sure that when it comes to firefighters, I don't want a bunch of politicians from the Illinois State Legislature with all their corruption deciding how many men should, or, or firefighters should run into a burning building. I want the firefighters at the table. I want the teachers at the table. I'm not asking for too much by saying that, end of parentheses. So my point is, my point is that um, whatever, the, whatever the most privileged have should be our baseline that we are moving toward. Not something we can accomplish tomorrow. So when I th see things like a story, upper left-hand corner of the New York Times last year, picture of a little African-American girl looking over a pen into a group of piglets with their mother. And the headline in the New York Times is, trip to the farm may increase test scores. And I want to jump off a bridge. I are you kidding me? Are you saying to me that you or me or Barack and Michelle or Arnie would say, you know, Girls, we'd love, love, love to take you to the farm, but there's no evidence it'll improve your test scores, so we're not going. Nor are we going to the violin lesson, the piano lesson, the museum, the concert, the opera, the vacation in Hawaii, or a camping trip. 
We would never say that about our own children. Why do we so easily say it about other people's children and let it just fall away? It's not fair, it's not just, it's not reasonable, and it's not good policy. So I want to argue whatever you know, the most privileged have becomes our standard. I, in other parentheses, this happens to me, sorry. But in Chicago, our mayor, who you may know was the chief of staff in the White House, Rahm Emanuel, don't get me started, but his big campaign in Chicago has been for a longer school day, 90 more minutes, 90 more minutes. The teachers rejected it, so he went school by school, and he said, I'll give each of you teachers a 2% raise, and I'll give your school $1,500 discretionary money if you'll make a longer day. And nine schools so far have said, okay. They took the bribe, and they're gonna have a longer day. Now one asks, and, and, and it becomes so much the framing in Chicago for how people think about now, because he said it so many times and so noisily, that, it's, that the Sun-Times, the Chicago Sun-Times last week, runs the Illinois report cards, and they have it under the headline, longer day yields better results. And what do they point to? Schools in Winnetka, Lake Forest, Glencoe, the Tony North Shore schools, and they discovered that those schools do have better test scores, and they do have a longer day. And what do they do with that longer day? An hour for lunch, physical education, art, music, clubs, hello, could there be something in there? No, no, it's all about minutes. It's all about the minutes you spend being drilled and killed in your classroom. It's a false framing, and what kills me about it is if you focus your energy on that longer day, what you're missing talking about is things like poverty, things like access, things like arts and music, which are essential for a democratic society, essential for full participation in the culture of our society. So, oh, and parenthetically, to talk about what the, the most privileged people have, Rahm Emanuel's kids go to the lab school where they have a shorter day. So could the day really be, I mean, could it really be about the length of the day? His kids go to lab school. They have a shorter day and a shorter year. Teachers have teacher meetings every week. That used to drive me nuts. But, you know, it's a good thing. It's a good thing, even if it drives you nuts. So that's my short pitch for democracy and education. And to, if you keep one thing in mind as you think about the various innovations and things that we want to accomplish, let's hold in our minds the idea that in a democracy, we want to teach the values of initiative, courage, entrepreneurship, and all the rest. Part two, I'm already to part two. Um, the big questions, um, the big questions. Paul Gauguin, did I say that correctly? The artist, the friend, you can correct me. Um, Paul Gauguin, uh, who by all accounts was quite mad, um, quite crazy, sad, depressed, confused. Um, Gauguin um, suffered from what Ronald Wright called cosmological vertigo, brought on by the scientific breakthroughs of the Victorian era, mostly Darwinism and it drove him quite crazy. In 1897, after months of illness and suicidal despair, he produced a huge painting, really kind of a collage, um, which, which was a sprawling panorama of enigmatic figures amid scenery that might have been the groves of heathen Tahiti or an unruly Garden of Eden. It's a very weird painting. And the title of the painting he wrote in large black letters across the front of it. The title of the painting is, Where Do We Come From? What are we, and where are we going? To me, these are great foundational questions. And when I learned this about Gauguin's painting, I had long, as a teacher, um, created what I think uh, is important, which is a curriculum of questions. And I want to talk for just a minute, because I think Gauguin captures what I think are foundational questions um, for teachers to think about and for educated people to think about. Where do we come from? What are we, and where are we going? In 1963, during the Civil Rights Movement, a young volunteer from the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee named Charlie Cobb, uh, you know, I know we tell the story of the Civil Rights Movement as if it were a neat arc that started from a bad place and then went up, 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 and then we all won. Uh, that's a little bit of a distortion. Um, I was there. But uh, Charlie Cobb, at a point when the, when the movement was hitting a bump and no one was sure where we were gonna go, um, wrote what, what, he initiated um, a freedom school curriculum in Mississippi 
um, part of the voting rights um, campaigns and so on. And you can find it now online. It's called Freedom School, Mississippi Freedom School Curriculum 1964. But Cobb wrote a proposal. And in those days, a proposal was mimeographed for the younger people. Google that, mimeograph. Um, uh, it was mimeographed, two-sheet piece. It wasn't to the MacArthur Foundation, the Department of Education. It was to his friends. And in this little two-page piece, Charlie said, the black people of Mississippi have been denied many things, but the, they've been denied forward-looking curriculum, fully trained teachers, decent facilities, but the fundamental injury is they've been denied the right to think for themselves about the circumstances of their lives and how they might be otherwise. Think of Gauguin's questions. Where do we come from? What are we? And where are we going? Cobb proposed the same thing informally. And we developed at that time this curriculum. And it's 24 pages of questions. The opening questions are, why are you in the freedom movement? What do you hope to accomplish? Who are you? And what do you want to keep that you have? And what do you want to have that the majority culture has? On and on and on for 24 pages. This is the essential kind of democratic education. The idea that, and let's take Cobb's challenge and apply it to today. The kids on the west side of Chicago or the South Bronx or South Central LA have been denied many things. Decent facilities, fully trained teachers, forward looking curriculum. But the fundamental injury is the right to think for themselves about the circumstances of their lives and how they might be otherwise. That question can cause an explosion of real learning with kids really de developing a sense, not that they're little victims encaged and having stuff poured into their inert heads, but people who can figure things out and can solve the real problems in front of them. And it, think of how more vibrant and exciting education could be on the west side of Chicago if we were powered by those kinds of questions rather than the sit down, shut up, spend another hour drilling and killing kinds of questions. On and on, Cobb, Cobb's notion was a notion of an education for free people, an education that would allow you to be a free person. So the big questions have to characterize whether you teach in a traditional classroom or online or homeschooling, they have to be part of what we think about when we think about education. My teaching, and I believe every good classroom, can have these implicit questions woven into them. Questions, what's your story? How did you get here? How is your story like or unlike other stories? What do you know? What do you need to know? What do you want to know? What do you need to know to be an educated person? These questions can animate an educational project that's so dramatically different than what we take to be schooling and learning. It's not just a matter of pouring content into inert heads. It's a matter of getting folks, ourselves included, oriented towards asking questions of the universe and demanding answers for ourselves and our community. Part three, the, the key radical, actually, I'm gonna run out of time. I'm going to part four. Forget part three. Okay, part four. Um, <laughs> Part three, you know, briefly, part three is, is, is encompassed in part four. That's okay, part four. Um, and where is it? It's here somewhere. Um, part four, Instructions for Living a Life. This is a title of a small piece of, uh, a, a small bit inside a longer poem by Mary Oliver. And she calls it Instructions for Living a Life. And she says this, um, it's three lines. She says, um, pay attention, be astonished, tell about it. I had a fourth in a minute, but that's the, those are the instructions for living life. Pay attention, be astonished, tell about it. Let's start with pay attention. Pay attention means opening your eyes to the world as it is. And as I said at the beginning, no matter how hard you try to be an intentional, open, thoughtful, learning person on a pathway to discovering new things, you're a finite being. You can only open your eyes so much. So opening your eyes is something you do not once, but again and again and again. And you try to get up every morning and say, what am I missing? What am I not seeing? Let me do a quick mind experiment. You're against slavery, right? Jeez, that was depressing. OK. <clears throat> I'm going to try again. You're against slavery, right? Yes. Jesus. Um, still not loud enough, but that's OK. I assume you're against slavery, and good for you. Um, 
you're, you're very progressive. And 150 years ago in this country, would you have been against slavery? Let's, let's come on, let's give ourselves a, a boost. Sure we would, right? Absolutely. Uh, every one of us, the African-American folks here would have been part of the enslaved people. They would have been leading rebellions. The white folks here would have been abolitionists marching through the streets and running with Harriet Tubman and John Brown. Bless us, everyone. The only problem with that is that if you were against slavery 150 years ago, you were not only against the Constitution, the founders, the, and the law, you were against the Bible and your preacher and your parents and your neighbors and everyone else. Mark Twain, the brilliant Mark Twain, has a wonderful, wonderful essay called Free Speech is for the Grave. And in it he says, no, no, you're not allowed to say what you think until you're dead. And then you're allowed to say exactly what you think. Until then, and the reason you're not allowed to say what you think is because of convention. You don't want to be a wise guy. You don't want to be noisy. You don't want to be singled out and held up to scrutiny. You don't want to be seen to be either self-righteous or irritating. So just go along. And Twain ends this very funny, cute, quirky essay by saying the killer example in my life is slavery. I don't know a single person who's for it. I don't know a single person who's spoken up loudly against it. That's Mark Twain. Wow. So yes, we would have been. Bless us, everyone. And you're for a woman's right to vote, right? Yes. Not, not just the women. Come on, men. <laughs> Jeez. This is a depressing experience up here, I'm telling you. No, it's not. Um, yes, we are all for a woman's right to vote. And 100 years ago, a mere 100 years ago, if you were for a woman's right to vote, you would have been a crazy activist, anarchist, commie, socialist, something or other. And you would have been against the Constitution and the founders and the law and common sense and the Bible and right down the line. So let's pretend that we would have been all those good things. And then let's fast forward to today. And let's remind ourselves that we are not seeing more than we're seeing. We do not see a, an infinite amount more than we see. So what are we not seeing that 40 years from now, your grandchildren will say, Grandma, how about this? Grandma, were you around when the first African-American president was elected? You could say, yes, I was. If things work out, you say, yes, I was. And, uh, and were you at the inauguration? Yes, I was also in Chicago. That, nobody will know. Um, you can just say, <laughs> say you were there. I was there. But I, I didn't see any of y'all there, but I was there. Um, but there were a million people there, so it doesn't matter. You can just say you were there. And then, your, and then your granddaughter will say, and is it true that it cost him half a billion dollars to get elected the first time and a billion the second time? And you'll say, really? I don't remember that. Remember it. A half a billion dollars, and your granddaughter will say, you call that democracy? Are you kidding me? That's a perversion of democracy. That's like some banana republic that you all self-righteously criticized. I mean, come on. It may not work out that way, but I'm just saying it could. And your, grandma, and your granddaughter will say, and is it true that you were at the Big Ideas Fest 2011? Oh yeah, I was there, it was great. And uh, is it true that there were 12,000 men caged within 20 miles of where you were having your meeting? Really? Not only that, there were two and a half million of your fellow, prison, uh, fellow citizens in prison. And you can say, geez, I didn't know that. Well, now you know it. And this is the problem with paying attention. I mean, I'm just throwing these out as hypotheticals. They're just my shticks. You have your own. But the point is still important, and that is, what are you not seeing because it's been naturalized, because it's been normalized, because it's how we come to think as, eh, I remember when homeless children were unthinkable. Now, eh, you know, it's what happens. I mean, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? And start with opening your eyes and seeing the world as it is and demanding that you see it as it is again and again and again. Quick example from literature. Take a film like this film from Brazil that won an Academy Award 10 years ago, Central Station. Um, it, some of you saw it, a wonderful film. It's about a teacher who sits in the Central Station of Rio de Janeiro and she writes letters for the illiterate. She writes things for illiterate people. And one day a guy comes to her early in the film and says, Dora, I'd like you to pick up this 10-year-old boy at this part of Rio, take him across the city and deliver him to an American couple who's going to adopt him. I'll give you $100. Well, great offer, great idea. She goes, does the job, takes the kid across the city, gets the 100 bucks on her way home, buys a color TV. When she gets back to her modest place, her neighbors come over and she, they say, where'd you get the TV? And she tells the story. And they say, Dora, are you insane? Are you an idiot? 
Don't you know, don't you read the papers? Don't you know that that boy was being kidnapped and sent on to the international market for organ donors? He's probably dead by now, and you participated. And she's horrified. This all happens in the first few minutes. And for people like us, who are the audience for a film like that, we expect her to do exactly what she does. She retraces her steps and tries to save the boy. Because once her eyes were opened, she had to do the moral thing, or we would condemn her. So here's the question for us. Uh, how are our eyes closed? What are we missing? What are we participating in that we don't see or don't want to see? I think of my beloved mother. I was taking care of her 20 years ago. She had broken her ankle, and she asked me quite innocently, and this was in the innocent days of, of global warming, but she asked me quite innocently, what is global warming? And I told her a very mild story. I didn't want to scare the shit out of the old lady. I just like, you know, yeah, you know, it's not good. And uh, she lived in suburban bliss, and she looked at me with a big frown and a scowl, and she said, well, I'm sorry I asked. Exactly. I'm sorry I asked, because then I have to do something. I don't want to do anything. My pool is full. My golf course is watered. What the hell are you talking about? So this is the problem that we face. This is the moral problem that we face. You cannot be a moral person with your eyes closed. You can't be a citizen. You can't be a good school reformer. You can't be a great teacher. And if there's one lesson we should teach our students, it's open your eyes. Next to that, Mary Oliver, be astonished. Be astonished at the, at the injustices of it all. Be astonished at the ecstasy of it all. Be astonished and embrace it all. And then tell about it. Or in my vocabulary, act. Do something. Do something. And my students for years, I mean, they'd hear me go on at this stuff for hours. And they would say, well, I can't do everything. And my response is, nobody asked you to do everything. Do anything. Do anything and then connect it to other anythings, and that's how a movement gets built. You don't have to do everything. What you have to do is something. And if you do nothing, if you sit on your couch and have good ideas, that's not moral action. That's not citizenship. That's not participation. That's just you being smug and, and self-centered and sure of yourself, and it's wrong. We have to get out, talk to strangers, do something. And then my final advice on that is we have to doubt. And the reason we have to doubt is because we are, as human beings, completely subject to dogmatism. We are always subject to thinking that our ideas in our narcissistic you know, default position are the best ideas. And we're, we're prone to thinking things like, because I have a doctorate, everyone should have a doctorate. Or I have a law degree, you all should have law degrees. It's nonsense, and it's not even sensible. So when we say things like, all to college, I don't even begin to understand that it's a metaphor. And what people say, when, what they think when they say everyone 100% to college, they're thinking about Beloit or Grinnell or you know, some little green campus where everybody is a resident. That accounts for 2% of American higher education. So get over yourself. It's not Harvard. When I think of college, I think of $30,000 of debt and two years of training that didn't do very much. So let's not use these shorthand metaphors. Let's talk about what we mean and talk realistically about what we're going to get. So our own dogma is what I'm worrying about. Again, I think it's easy to identify the dogma of the House Republicans. Too easy. It's your dogma you should worry about. And I'm thinking about, you know the, the um, movie, uh, The Life of Brian, Monty Python? You know, um, if you don't know it, Google it. Um, I keep saying that, I don't know why. Uh, the Life of Brian. The Life of Brian is about a reluctant Messiah. And at one point, he's up on a rampart in a place like Jerusalem, and he's yelling to the masses of below. And he's saying, um, I'm not the Messiah. And they say, you're not the Messiah. And he said, no, you have minds of your own. And they say, we have minds of our own. And, um, <laughs> and one guy in the crowd says, it's funny, I don't feel like I have a mind of my own. And everybody says, shut up, you have a mind of your own. So. <clears throat> That's the world I worry that we live in. You know, I went to see a Montessori school 25 years ago for my wife's colleague, a lawyer. She was gonna send her kids there, and we went around, and the whole time we were going around, she was saying, Maria Montessori would say the children are doing such, and Maria Montessori would say this, and Maria Montessori, I felt like I was being hypnotized. So I said to my friend at the break, um, don't drink the Kool-Aid, and then, and then I said, uh, and then the parents were talking about Carl Rogers and Carl Jung, the great humanitarian psychologist, and, and I said, uh, uh, humanistic psychologist, and I said, um, apropos of that conversation, you know, Carl Jung once said, I'm glad I'm Jung, 
and not a Jungian because I can still change my mind. And the, and the Montessori woman said, Maria Montessori said the same thing. And once again, I wanted to <laughs> jump off a bridge, you know? Yeah, of course she did, absolutely. And uh, you, you know, once you're stuck in your own dogma, you have a real problem getting the horizons of your imagination agitated. And you have to war against it consciously all the time because it's the default position. So. Those to me are, are, are that's the, what, what Mary Oliver calls instructions for living a life. When I think about what is to be done, I think about, often about um, Rosa Luxemburg, the great revolutionary at the turn of the last century. She was in prison for refusing World War I, and she got a letter from a friend whining about how hard it was on the outside, and Luxemburg wrote back, and she said, stop whining. And then she said this, um, you must learn to be a mensch. Mensch is a Yiddish word, um, for those of you who don't know. She says, you must learn to be a mensch. I can't define it for you, but being a mensch means loving your own life enough to enjoy the sunrise and the sunset, a good meal with friends, taking care of the elders and the children. But it means loving the world enough to put your shoulder on history's wheel when history requires it. Love yourself, love the world, and get out and get busy. Thanks very much. Thanks.